Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's webinar with Melinda Myers. We're just going to give everyone a couple minutes to join the program here. I see our participant list is growing rapidly. So we'll get going in just a moment here and we'll learn more about growing a bountiful harvest even when time, space, and budget are limited. So thanks for joining us tonight. We'll get started in just a moment. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So good evening again, everyone. My name is Kelly Bolter, the Adult Programming Coordinator at Milwaukee Public Library. Um, I am very excited to welcome back uh, Melinda Myers. Uh, tonight, Melinda will be talking about growing a bountiful harvest even when time, space, and budget are limited. So this uh, webinar event is being recorded. Um, if you are registered and unable to make it or have to duck out early, you'll get an email within a couple of days with the link to that, um, the full recording on Milwaukee Public Library's YouTube channel. Um, joining us also tonight is Librarian Beth, our uh, East Branch Adult Services Librarian. Um, Beth will be hanging out in the background uh, along with myself. We'll keep an eye on the Q&A and the chat windows. So we will have time at the end of the program for um, questions from Melinda. If you have any questions in the meantime, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A and you can chat amongst yourselves in the chat box. Um, again, we will have time at the end to go over those. Um, you'll notice your microphone and video are turned off. Um, so yeah, we'll have the interactive time at the end with the Q&A with Melinda. So without further ado, I will hand it over to uh, Melinda. So thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Always a pleasure. And thank all of you for joining me. Um, I think we are all drooling over these tomatoes, thinking about fresh from the garden tomatoes that none of us can wait for. So let's get started. I always like to thank my sponsors. We Energies is sponsoring this webinar, but also our joint project with the Public Libraries of Wisconsin and the UP of Michigan. So welcome all of you um, folks from our uh, constituents of the library, gardeners from Wisconsin, the UP and beyond. We're happy to have you. Thanks to We Energies for sponsoring this and the libraries for participating and helping us get the word out. So gardening is good for our mind, body and spirit. If you're a gardener, you already know that. But I think I love, one of the benefits I love is this is my favorite form of exercise. Planting, tilling and even weeding can burn calories and so I always feel like it's easier to stay in shape during the growing season. So everything we do to manage our landscape helps keep us flexible, strengthens our muscles, and it burns calories as well. Um, always start with a plan. Now, I know when we go to the garden center, our first trip to the garden center, we always buy more than maybe we have room for, things that aren't on our list. But if we start with a plan, we're less likely to buy those things that won't thrive in our landscape or that our family won't eat. So grow what you like, things that you use in your recipes, things that your family likes to eat. I like okra, my family doesn't. And I'd always find a pile of okra at the edge of their plate. And they'd always go, you can't sneak it in on us, mom. Um, but I like to try new things too. Sometimes I'll go to the farmer's market and buy something new and different, try it there first. And if I like it, add it to my list for the next year. Think about what's economical to grow. Sweet corn is delicious, but it takes up a lot of space for the amount of harvest you get. Tomatoes, on the other hand, you may have eight pounds of tomatoes from one plant, depending on the variety. So think about what makes sense if space and time are limited. And then what's nutritious? Most vegetables are, some more than others. So we'll talk about those as we go through. Your handout has a lot more detail than I'll have time to cover. So this is kind of a way that I could cover the high points and then you can use that handout as a reference. So just a few basics, things that we eat the fruit, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, melons, broccoli, cauliflower, things we eat the flowers, need the most sunlight. 
when you look at most gardening books, they talk about six hours being full sun. I like to say eight hours or more because I know how gardeners are. If I tell you six, then four, ah, close enough. So if I say eight, hopefully I'll get at least six, preferably eight hours or more. The more sunlight, the more energy the plant produces, the better productivity. Um, root crops like full sun as well, but they'll also tolerate half day of sun, four to six hours. So if only part of your garden is full sun, save it for those things you eat, the flowers and fruit. Use the shadier parts for your root crops like carrots and beets or your greens. They're the most shade tolerant. Again, they like full sun, but they'll tolerate those shadier conditions. And the benefit of putting them in a little afternoon shade is they'll tend to continue to grow and produce even as the temperatures rise because they'll have a little bit of cooling from that afternoon shade. So they tend to flower and set seed later. So you continue to harvest longer. Um, vegetables, like most plants, like moist, well-drained soils. Now, one option is to incorporate compost into that soil. Now, um, a lot of you may be going to no-dig or no-till methods, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But adding compost, whether you make it yourself or purchase it, um, improves drainage in heavy soils, increases water holding ability in sandy, fast draining soils. And research has shown that compost amended soils uh, promote healthy growth and plants are less susceptible, more resistant to insects and disease. Maybe you want to convert your lawn to a garden. And this was one of the Melinda's garden moments we did. And the video is on my website. But we used a sod cutter to remove the sod. The soil was in fairly good shape, but we did add some compost and we were able to plant right away. You can also smother the grass, but that takes a while to kill the grass, whether it's with black plastic um, to block the sunlight, uh, cardboard and compost, cut through the cardboard and plant in that soil. I find doing that the season before you want to plant is much easier, but removing the sod, amending the soil gives you a quick start for this season. Um, when I moved from the city, I gardened in the city of Milwaukee for more than 26 years and had a small city lot. Um, I'd worked on amending my soil, mulching with organic matter, um, adding compost, and I had great soil. I moved to an area about 10, well, about 13 years ago, sandy soil, and I thought, I don't have 26 years to create good stuff. So I started doing some no-till methods like lasagna gardening, measured out my beds, covered the soil with newspaper to block any weeds, added eight to 10 inches of compostable material, covered that layer with compost and sprinkled some fertilizer, another eight to 10 inches. Sounds like building a compost pile, doesn't it? And then I planted that year. One of the things you may want to do is your lasagna garden building in the fall when you have lots of the raw materials readily available, build it and plant in the spring. Either way, it works great. I had excellent productivity that first season and even for the following couple of years, the bed settles. So now it's even with the surrounding soil, but I can tell the beds are still producing quite well. I mentioned you could make your own, and if you're not composting, consider that. Now, you may want to check with your local municipality. Some urban areas do have restrictions because rodents are an issue anywhere you live, but especially in urban environments. And so composting is as easily as putting plant-based waste material, whether it's food scraps, those outer leaves of lettuce or kale that you couldn't eat, fall leaves, uh, annual weeds that have not flowered or gone to seeds, no perennial weeds because they'll probably grow in your compost pile, nothing that's disease or insect infested, it will probably survive because most of us don't compost hot enough. But um, if you compost it, put it in a pile and it'll eventually decompose. The more effort you put in, the faster you get compost. I do have a link to a video and some information on composting because that's a whole session in and of itself. Um, you don't need anything fancy. Bins are just to keep it from falling apart and, and spreading into the garden or masking it so your neighbors don't have to look at it. 
I love the dual bin method, and this is made of heavy plastic. This one happens to be from Gardner Supply. This is approved by most municipalities because it's a closed system. So in one of the bins, we put our raw materials. In the other bit, once that bin is full, we add a little fertilizer, a little compost to kind of get those microorganisms in there, moisten it to the consistency of a damp sponge, and we can just spin it. Then we stockpile in the other bin. So by the time the compost is finished in the one bin, we empty it. The one we've been stockpiling our raw materials is ready to be composted. And so you just keep switching back and forth. And I like this method. There are bigger bins, or maybe you have two large tumbling bins. And that way you've got an enclosed system. You can have an active pile so it composts faster and a place to stockpile the raw materials. And then worm composting. If you like to fish or someone in your family does, this is a great way to grow your own fishing bait. If you have youngsters in your life, growing worms is sometimes more exciting than growing plants. And all you need is a bin with drainage holes. A storage bin works great, or you can buy a worm farm or composter, shredded paper, so most of us have that available. A handful of compost or soil, that's the grit that the worms use to digest all your raw food scraps, plant-based food scraps. No meat, no dairy, no cheese. That goes for regular composting as well as worm composting. And again, I've got a link that'll talk more in detail. I buy my red worms from a nearby bait store, so readily available. And it's amazing how fast they can convert the kitchen scraps and the paper into a worm castings, which are nutrient rich, great soil amendment. Use it as a fertilizer in your containers. You could amend your gardens, but usually we don't have as much of this as we can, can produce in our big compost piles. So I use it to amend my potting mixes in raised beds, areas where I've got smaller amounts that I'm trying to improve the nutrient level and the soil. Always call before you dig. Um, I work with Diggers Hotline here in Wisconsin, but anywhere in the country, call 811 before you start digging. And if we have any of my Canadian gardening friends, I know you have a similar service. And basically, when you contact the Underground Utility Locating Service, they contact all the utilities that will come out and mark any underground utilities in your work area. It's important for your safety because if you hit an underground utility, you could be injured or even killed depending on the utility. Any inconvenience, you hit the cable line and guess what? No one's going to like you. And it saves you money because if you knock out an underground utility and you have not contacted them at least three business days before putting the first shovel in the ground, you're responsible for fixing it. And who wants to spend money on fixing cable and you don't even want to think about repairing fiber optic? Hey, Melinda. This yes. Is Callie, sorry to jump in. Um, it looks like the slides aren't advancing on the screen. We're just seeing the main, the first page um, with the oh, title card. Oh, okay. That's interesting. They're advancing on mine. So I'm going to escape. Hmm. Do I need to? I'm going to get out of here. Um, okay. Let me try. I'm yeah, sorry, I, you all see my desktop now. Uh, let me try hitting my keynote. Oh, I got kicked out of that totally. So sorry. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you told me that. We'll quickly go through. I'm going to have to go find my keynote. I got booted out of there. Um, sorry about that. That is too weird. It's probably something I did wrong. So, so sorry. I'm going to put my glasses on the prints. Oh, here we go. Hmm. Okay. Hopefully you're seeing thank you to We Energies. So if you go ahead and click the share screen button. Again oh, I didn't. Okay. Um, and it's not. Okay, here we go. That would help, wouldn't it? Um, let me try this one. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, so yeah, we're seeing that first slide. There we go. Okay. okay, sorry, folks. I'll just kind of quickly flip through so you can remember what I said about gardening being good for your mind, body, and spirit. Starting with a plan. This is to make you all hungry and want to go out and buy transplants and seeds and get your garden ready when it's right. Um, full sun for those things you eat, the flowers and the fruit. Root crops more shade tolerant. Greens are the most shade tolerant. Preparing that soil. This was a, a garden we converted. And this was that lasagna gardening I was talking about doing layers of compost and uh, raw materials. A compost bin. This is the dual bin, it might help to see it. Thank you for stopping me, Kelly. Um, so that's the dual bin composter and worm cast, worm composting, calling 811. And so I think we're caught up now. Sorry about that, folks. So fertilizing, um, a soil test is always a good place to start. It will tell you what, if any, fertilizer is needed. Give it about two weeks from the time you test. Contact your local extension service. If the university extension doesn't test soil, they'll probably have a list of certified soil testing labs. Um, You'll want to, if you don't have that, I like low nitrogen, slow release fertilizers because it feeds the plants a little bit over a longer period. Those of you that know me know I'm a fan of Milorganite, but pick one that works well for you. If you do a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizing in the spring, um, prep it when you prep the soil, and if needed midsummer. Now, depending on your soil, you may or may not need that second application six to eight weeks after the first. And then in general, three pounds of a low nitrogen per hundred square feet. Water's the next important thing. We need to keep the seedlings after we plant our seeds or our young transplants, keep that soil moist. Um, for our transplants, we wanna water thoroughly, keeping that area around the root ball moist. Gradually, we're gonna extend the time between watering um, as those plants start developing a more robust root system. So we're gonna give them a good soaking, typically one inch of water per week. Now I'm in sandy soil, so I need to monitor, maybe I do a good soaking every four or five days, depending on the weather, and depending on if I mulch or not. If you have heavy soil and the temperatures aren't too hot, probably once a week is enough. Um, I like to conserve water, and this is another way that you can also reduce your time spent watering mulch. As you can see, I rounded up evergreen needles and fall leaves, things that were in my landscape. So I was repurposing them as mulch. Covering that soil with a layer of that material is a great way. It conserves moisture, so you water less. Suppresses weeds, means less weeding. And as that mulch breaks down, it improves the soil. So you get three benefits from that one activity. Sometimes I like to think of them as twofers. You know, I weed the garden, I burn calories, and I, I take care of the weeds. I mulch the garden, I burn calories, I suppress weeds, I um, conserve moisture. So, you know, you get a lot of benefits. It makes it easier to go, that's a good job I want to invest time in. Um, and a lot of us are warming up our water before we take fill the bathtub or take our shower. How about keeping a five gallon bucket in the tub? And as you're warming up that shower water, collect it and use it on your garden or on your containers. It's a great way to conserve water and get the most out of that. So don't let that go down the drain, but rather capture it and use it on your garden plants. You can also extend time between watering, especially with container gardens, with some of these commercial watering devices or do your own. This is just one of the examples. This is a plant nanny and it's a hollow terracotta um, spike. You punch a hole in the soil, place this in the soil, empty a wine bottle, however you choose, fill it with water. I like to use colorful bottles because I think it adds a little artistic value to that planting. Fill that with water, turn it over, and Water moves from high concentrations to low concentrations through that terracotta spike. So as the soil dries, um, the water moves through there. 
Larger containers, you may need a couple tests before you leave town. This is a great way to extend the time if you're busy or if you, you know, go away for the weekends, but test to make sure maybe you need a couple of those per pot. I had a gardener at one of the shows I was speaking at telling me she used to garden, have pots on her patio when she lived in Arizona. And this was the only way she could keep them watered sufficiently. And it really extended the time between watering. Or some people will just punch a hole in the soil, use that wine bottle or a two liter soda bottle and punch holes in the lid of the soda bottle, turn it upside down and use that as a self-watering device. Uh, those of you who've heard me speak before know, um, I've mentioned wool pellets before. It's a sustainable organic product. A sheep rancher uh, worked with the university to analyze this so it has some nutrient value. It also reduces watering by up to 25%, adds airspace in your soil so it promotes good, healthy plant growth. And since, unless you live in Utah where you wouldn't have to ship large quantities, it really makes sense for containers or elevated or raised beds to add this and it will really extend the time between watering. So now as you're looking at your vegetables and deciding what to plant, you probably hear the term short and long season vegetables. So radishes, lettuce, they're short season vegetables. Radishes also like it cool. The salad radishes are ready from seed to harvest in 25 to 30 days. So those are ready pretty quick. Tomatoes and peppers, on the other hand, need more days, 80 to 110. So depending on where you live, so if you have a short growing season, you're probably going to either start the seeds indoors and then transplant those seedlings outside when the weather's right or buy transplants at your garden center. That way you have more time to harvest in that shorter growing season. Being budget wise, if you buy seeds, you know, we usually get more seeds than you need. And so maybe you want to do a seed swap and there's information on our library program website on seed swaps. And I know some garden clubs host them, some libraries may be hosting, check with your local library or host your own and you can share seeds among each other. So maybe you buy tomatoes and your friend buys peppers and you share those seeds. So you've only invested in one packet of vegetable seeds, but now you have two different types of seeds. When you're buying at the garden center, maybe go in with friends, look at the difference in price. You know, if you bought a four pack for $249, just think you've got four plants. And if you don't need all four, divide that price by four and it's a pretty economical plant versus buying maybe a celebrity tomato in an individual pot, which may be $1.99 or $2.50 for one plant. And so that's one way to extend your budget. And if you could extend your planting budget, you can buy more. Okay, so I'm going to cover a few of the more nutritious vegetables and some that are very economical as well. And we're going to go through the season at planting time. So the first thing in your garden could be asparagus. And asparagus is very nutritious, can be pretty pricey as well. And it's a perennial crop. So you're going to plant it this year and have hopefully decades of harvest to make. Um, after you harvest the spears for a couple of weeks. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is what you're left with throughout the growing season. Those greens produce the energy so you have a good crop the following year. You're going to buy either plants or the roots like you see here, the crowns with the roots attached. If you buy two-year crowns, which is what a lot of places sell, you'll be harvesting, doing a light harvest the next year. So you're going to dig a trench at least six inches deep, preferably 12 inches, amend that soil, spread the roots out. The Ohio State University found you didn't have to do that, but I, out of habit, I do that. Um, you're going to plant your plants a couple feet apart, your rows three feet apart, and then spread those roots out, cover them with soil as they grow. So as those greens sprout, you're going to just keep covering them until that trench is totally full. And then you're done planting. Um, weed control, I find, is my biggest problem with my asparagus patch. In fact, I need to do it. So when can you harvest? The following year, if you use two-year-old crowns, you can harvest for one month because you need to let that plant produce those greens sooner rather than later so that you'll have more roots develop and a sturdier crop that's gonna last for decades. So when the spears are six to eight inches long, break them off 
at soil line, or you can use a sharp knife, cut below the soil line, but be careful because there'll be young spears coming up. The next year, you'll be able to harvest for six to eight weeks. And this is all in the handout, so that should make it easier. You don't have a lot of room. You know, you have a small urban lot or suburban lot, and don't have room for a dedicated asparagus patch, put it in the back of your flower garden, a perennial garden, that's a great way. You could have the asparagus harvest early in the season, let the greenery go, and it's a great backdrop for your flowers. The other thing we're going to plant early in the season are our cool season vegetables for those of us in the north. Those of you in the south um, are probably already into your warm season. So we'll just call them cool season plants. And so my apologies to those of you in the South who are a little bit in a different schedule than I am. So lettuce, spinach, and greens. These are things we plant typically in early spring. They may be winter crops for those of you in the South. Growing your own greens are economical. Um, because it is economical to grow and harvest your own. You'll get the best flavor because you're picking them and using them right away and the most nutritional value. The less time vegetables spend in transit or at the garden, uh, the grocery store on the shelf, the higher the nutritional value. So we're gonna plant them typically for most of us early spring. Um, and then you can also continue depending on the vegetable, how heat tolerant, and then you can do it late season for a fall harvest. So we've planted our greens and it's almost impossible, right? To plant the seeds at the final spacing. And most packets recommend close spacing and then say thin to six inches apart, but don't compost those thinnings, use them in your salad, lettuce, spinach, beet greens, those are all very edible and tasty. So think of it as an early harvest rather than thinning. So thinning removes those seedlings to leave the remaining ones in the soil with enough room for the plants to reach their mature size. Um, for most lettuce, leaf lettuce, we are going to harvest when the outer leaves are four to six inches and they'll keep producing new leaves in the center and that will keep it producing. As the weather gets warm, some of those uh, greens like lettuce and spinach will go to flower and seed and are bitter flavored. So that's why we plant those during the cooler season. There are some heat tolerant varieties of lettuce, salad bowl, Sandy, which is an All-America selection and red sails, as well as the oak leaf type, which Sandy is one of, tend to be more heat tolerant. So, you know, if you want to extend that season, try one of these varieties. They'll hold up in the heat and they'll flower later. And so you'll get a longer harvest. Be creative. I like to grow my greens. This is my salad bar. We display this at the Wisconsin State Fair Park because it elevates it me makes it easier for planting, easier for harvesting. If it's convenient, I'll do it. And it also helps elevate it above the hungry rabbits. So it makes it much easier. Plus growing greens in a pot, you can start them early, put them out when the weather's good, bring them back in. We had 29 degrees uh, last night, I think, and the night before. And Lettuce will tolerate a frost, but when it gets to be 29 for a long period, you'll see some damage. Won't kill the plant, but why suffer? Bring that pot of greens in. Keep it convenient. It's pretty, decorative, and edible. And then have some fun. Maybe this is one way to get the kids excited about growing vegetables and eating them as well. There are all kinds of vertical planters available and greens are excellent way to do that. And maybe have some fun, grow them in some gutters or some other unique plantings. Kale collards and chard are also um, cold weather tolerant. They'll take cool soil, cool air, and even tolerate a light frost. So these are others for those of us in milder or colder climates, Midwest and North, we're planting early spring and then again in midsummer into fall. I find kale collards and chard are more heat tolerant than my spinach and lettuce. And I often have good success growing them throughout the summer, but I'm also in Wisconsin. So my summers were pretty hot last year, but not as hot as some parts of the country. Swiss chard is a beautiful plant. This is bright light Swiss chard. We used it as an 
annual ground cover at our state fair garden. Look at how beautiful it is when the light shines through. I grow up as a vertical accent in containers in the garden because it's pretty. It's also very nutritious. I'm growing baby chard this year to kind of get work my way up to the nutritious, bigger, more intense flavored uh, chard. The same goes with kale. This is an all America selection and this kale tended to spread um, width wise rather than height wise. Uh, the trial gardener at Burner Botanical Garden said this thing just grew and grew. She could not keep up with the harvest. Look at that texture. Here they've mixed it with dianthus and some salvia on the left and dianthus on the right. Pretty plant. The texture is beautiful. And so you've got an ornamental edible plant. Add it to your flower beds. You don't need to set it aside. If you um, find regular kale, a little too intense, try some of the baby leaf kale. Tuscan baby leaf is one of my favorite. A little bit milder flavor, harvest it when it's young. It still has some great nutritional value. I mentioned I like to use it in my, I like to use Swiss chard, but I also like to use kale and planters in the garden because I think they're beautiful and decorative as well as being edible. Um, colored greens, excellent, very nutritious. I have to say that um, I, I need to learn some more healthful ways of preparing it. I've done it in bacon, grease with bacon or ham, and it's very tasty, but steaming it, boiling it, uh, there's some more nutritious ways, less fattening ways to serve it up. Beautiful, another beautiful green, very productive. And again, this here in this container, it's being combined with pansies, another cool season plant. Harvest when the leaves are eight to 10 inches long, those outer leaves, that's when you'll get great flavor, great nutritional value, keeps it looking nice because if you're growing it as a decorative ornamental plant, as well as an edible plant, regular harvesting will improve the appearance. And I have good luck growing greens inside. This is in my shop and I just had a self-watering pot with a LED light attached. And this was, this was what my green plant, my greens look like this in January and February. So I was able to make fresh salads all winter long. So it might be a way to extend the season. Always great to grow them outside, but you know, when it's not conducive to grow greens outdoors, you might wanna move them inside. Root crops, these are also planted during the cooler months of the year, early spring for many of us. Um, and then again, mid to late summer for a uh, fall harvest. Um, if you have heavy soil, a lot of rocky soil grow shorts or half long carrots because when they hit rocks or heavy soil, they tend to split and don't produce those nice, long, thin roots that you're gonna eat. Um, a lot of people with, uh, root crops um, have problems with the roots forming, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but they're also very decorative. This is bull's blood beets. Look at those beautiful leaves. I think this was at Seed Savers in Iowa, but look at those dark purple leaves. They look beautiful with the osteospermum, the little daisy-like flowers on the right. Because they're a shorter season crop, because they're usually ready in anywhere, depending on what you're growing, radishes in 25 to 30 days, beets in 45 to 60 days, carrots a little bit longer. You can plant those in between your long season crops like ochre, which takes 80 to 110, depending on the varieties. So this is at Chicago Botanic Garden. They planted carrots in between the okra. So by the time the okra were big and filling in that space, the carrots could be harvested. So a great way to get two crops in one area. You always want to give them room to grow. So thinning is important. So failure to have roots on the bottom and just greens on top, make sure you're giving the roots enough space to grow. And if you read um, Bill, Mel Bartholomew's Square Foot Gardening, his original book, he counted there were over a thousand carrot seeds in one packet at that time. And I swear I planted all a thousand in a 30 foot row. So that means I was doing a lot of thinning. So I wasted seed and wasted a lot of time to make sure those carrots had sufficient room to grow. So if you're not getting the roots, one, make sure you've got good drainage, Two, make sure you're thinning so those roots have sufficient space to reach mature size. And then a soil test will tell you if you have enough nutrients in the soil. Phosphorus, the middle number on fertilizer, encourages root development, flowering, and fruiting. 
Most urban soils have a lot of that, but it's not available to the plant. So using organic fertilizers or malorganite, they found that malorganite, when the microorganisms work on releasing the nutrients, releases some of that phosphorus and potassium bound to the soil, making it available to the plants. So thinning, proper fertilization, and good, well-drained soils. Again, when we plant our seeds, we need to do some thinning. Radish seeds and beet seeds are very nutritious. And I'm this year going to try carrot greens because somebody told me you can make pesto out of carrot greens. Um, it's a pretty strong flavor. So I think making it into pesto might be the answer. So thinning, think of it as harvesting. Use these in salads, on sandwiches. Um, great way, very nutritious. Um, the seeds of carrots, radishes, and beets are hard to properly space because they're small. You can buy pelletized seeds. So these have a coating on them and that it makes it easier to space at the recommended amount. You'll probably still do some thinning, but you won't lose as many seeds because you'll be able to space them properly. The other thing you might want to invest in are seed tapes. Now these are biodegradable strips of paper that have the seeds glued with um, an eco-friendly, safe, food safe glue, and they space the seeds out. So you dig your furrow, lay out the tape, cover it with the soil water, your seeds are properly spaced. It's more expensive, but you waste less seeds because you're not thinning and less time doing the thinning. But if you're trying to save money, make your own. You can use paper towel, strips of newspaper, make your own glue, one cup of flour and a quarter cup of water. And this is much easier to space when you're sitting at the kitchen table and dab the glue in, place the seeds in place. If you're doing square foot gardening, use a square of paper towel and place the seeds at the right spacing. Then you can just remove that soil at the proper depth, lay that square paper towel, cover it, water it, and you're all set. And so it's a fun way to make your own seed tapes. When you're harvesting your root crops, it's best to dig, not pull, because you often, depending on your soil, you may leave the roots behind. Um, for beets, carrots, and radishes, you want to harvest when they're at the proper mature size. You'll find some beets that are grown for the greens, and some, if you harvest your beets when they're young, the beets will be tender. You can use the roots and the tops. Otherwise, let your beets reach their mature two-inch diameter size. Um, it's a great way to um, extend your harvest. You'll have the greens earlier, you'll have the beets. And by carefully digging, you'll do less damage as well. Now, how do you store them? You can store them in the refrigerator in a cool place. If you want a long-term storage, you can use a box or a bin. This is just a wire bin with a fabric liner filled with sawdust and layering your root crops and keeping them in a cool place place, like your basement far from the furnace. You can also, for those of us in the north and colder climates, overwinter parsnips, turnips, and carrots in the garden. And I've done that before where um, I've left them in the garden. When the garden got a little crunchy, not hard frozen, I mulched it with straw or marsh hay. Here in my garden, um, where I live now, I use floating row cover. And kept them intact. And then if you have a winter thaw, that's a great time to harvest so they don't rot. But I've had the sweetest tasting carrots by keeping them out in the garden. And it was a great way to extend my enjoyment, especially if storage space is limited. Peas are the other thing we plant early when the soil is nice and cool. They need cool temperatures, not only to sprout and grow, but when it gets warm, they're subject to powdery mildew. Sugar snap peas are the candy of the garden. Plant those out early in the season or when the start of your growing season, wherever you garden, when it's nice and cool. So with sugar snaps, we can do them early in the spring. We can do them midsummer for a fall harvest. So we're harvesting when the temperatures are cool. Sugar snap peas are those that are plump. We eat the whole thing, the pod and the pea seeds inside. Um, with regular English peas, we're going to wait till the seeds are obvious. We dispose of the pod in our compost pile, harvest the peas inside. And snow peas are flat, but we eat the pod and the seeds. Sugar snap peas like Sugar Ann and All America Selection are nice and sweet. Um, snack Hero is an um, 
edible potted pea, these are the size of green beans. Staking peas, these are vining plants, so you'll need to give them some type of support. This is the old English method where they used old trimmings from the landscape and used those to support the peas. Patio pride is great if you've got limited space and just want a pot on your patio or balcony. This is a great way to grow them. It grows about 18 to 24 inches tall. And look at all of those pea pods to eat and enjoy. You'll find a variety of uh, small scale snap peas. You can even try growing these indoors off season um, for a harvest when it's not good for gardening outside. Onions are another crop we plant when the soil is cool. And we'll plant our set, many onions um, in early to mid spring for those of us in the north and then transplants are those plants you either start inside yourself or by the garden center. We need to wait until later in spring to plant those once the soil is a bit warmer and the air is a bit warmer and we can plant those spring through summer. With onions, we'll be harvesting our onions as green onions. Um, when we can plant our sets closer together, harvest to thin and harvest them as green onions when the greens are like six to eight inches tall. And we'll be eating that bottom portion that's nice and white and tender. You can get creative and grow them in all kinds of containers, raised beds and in the garden. So from sets, as I mentioned, we're gonna harvest our green onions when they're six to eight inches tall. But if you're gonna store them or you want larger slicing onions, let the tops naturally fall over. That means they're done and they're ready to harvest. Harvest. When you are buying onions, the long, um, you want to look long day onions are suitable for the northern parts of the North America, and the short days are suitable for southern areas. Just check the packet, it should tell you the area where they grow. If you get the wrong ones, it'll set bulb before it has time to grow and put energy into it. So it's important to select the right onion variety for the area where you grow. Cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower, these are plants that like cool air and uh, soil. They really don't do well under frost. So you wanna be careful when you put your transplants out. Once they're established, they'll take cooler temperatures. In fact, after they form their flower heads, they're even sweeter and better flavor after a light frost. But as a young transplant, if they're subject to cold temperatures or stress, and they have a little head like this when you go shopping at the garden center, don't buy these because that's the biggest the head is going to get. I have had it happen to me where they've been buttoned and they form that little head. And so I just harvested it. I did get little sprouts, but I never had that nice big head of broccoli. And so we want to avoid frost, especially on cauliflower. They're very sensitive. We want to avoid stress on those young transplants. Um, let them get established. Then they can really take that cool soil, cool air for sure. Frost, just be aware that um, really cold temperatures, your cauliflower will set um, that small head called buttoning. Um, I have to tell you, um, I'll talk a bit about cauliflower in a minute, but that's my challenging vegetable to grow successfully. So you can grow these in a container, two gallons or larger, or in the ground and space them 12 to 18 inches apart. All the spacing information is on the handout, but it's also on the plant tag and your seed packets. So you'll find lots of colorful cauliflower and I find the green, orange and purple um, are a little bit easier to grow. Um, they don't tend to um, become kind of um, brown and not flavorful and bitter if they get too hot or if they're subject to frost at the wrong time. So when you're growing cauliflower, and I'll talk about broccoli and Brussels sprouts in a minute. When you're growing cauliflower, again, it likes it cool, but it won't tolerate frost. So make sure that when it's young, when it's a young plant, that it's not subject to frost. Then when that head starts to form and it's the size of a silver dollar, if it's not self-blanching, meaning the leaves fold up naturally over top, you'll need to fold those leaves over it to block the sunlight to keep it nice and white. Check it in five to seven days because the head will be full size. If you wait too long, it turns brown and bitter and it's not tasty. My problem with cauliflower is getting it in early 
and have it being able to harvest before it gets too hot, but not so early that it gets uh, nipped by an early season frost too soon. So that's the challenge I have with cauliflower. Broccoli, I find a lot easier. It will tolerate the frost, but you got to be careful that you're not stressing it and having it button, um, like I showed you before. Cool soil, cool air. We want to harvest our broccoli when the head's full size, but don't pull the plant. Instead, cut that head off and then allow the little sprouts to form. So even though it tastes best when harvested in cool temperatures, I've been able to harvest the sprouts all summer long. And then when the temperature started cooling in the fall, the flavor was much improved. Or plant midsummer for a fall harvest when it's nice and cool. And I know I'm going over this quickly, so I apologize, too much to cover. Um, cabbage, um, this is Savoy. It doesn't tend to store as well as the green and red. Red tends to have fewer cabbage worm problems, even though you see I had some here. And then the green cabbage, great in containers, great in the garden. Um, it likes cool temperatures, but much more heat tolerant. You're gonna harvest it when the head is full size, but don't pull the plant out, cut right below that head. You'll get four to five smaller heads forming. So you'll end up harvesting one large, four small heads of cabbage from one square foot of garden. You can make a lot of slaw and sauerkraut from that. Brussels sprouts are a longer season plant. And so for those of you that are gardening in a short season, you may need to do a little pruning later in the season. So it likes the cooler temperatures, it will tolerate the heat. But if your season's winding down soon, you may wanna pinch out the growing tip when those bottom sprouts, those are the first to mature, are about a half inch in diameter. That way the plant stops growing up, puts the energy in the sprouts, so those sprouts will be a fuller size at the end of the season. Broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts all taste better, more mild after a light frost. They'll tolerate temperatures down to 29 degrees once they're full size and mature. And so that's a time when they're very frost tolerant. So it extends that season into the fall for most of us. And this is what you're harvesting. You don't remove the need to remove the leaves like you see in the catalogs as you harvest from the bottom up. That usually happens by accident but not necessary. Plant your beans two weeks before you plant your tomatoes and peppers. It likes warm soil, it wants to be frost free. If you plant them in cool soil, corn root maggots can be a problem. You'll get poor germination or deformed seedlings. So just replant. So you want it to be warm to plant your beans. You can do that throughout the growing season, usually depending on the variety, about 60 days to maturity. Bush beans are low growing. You need to harvest regularly. And so I'll tell you, I'm not lazy, but bending over and picking those bush beans is a lot of hard work. So I like to grow mine vertically, like you see here. I get an extra picking, easier to harvest, takes less space as well. And pretty, I think, to have them growing vertically. Um, Scarlet runner bean, this is one that's good for the humming hummingbirds and it's also decorative with those pretty scarlet colored flowers. You can grow them in containers as well. Here they're in grow bags. And we're going to harvest our pole beans as snap beans before those seeds start swelling. And these are getting a little too ripe. You can still eat them. They're just not as tender and tasty. Um, if you're going to dry them, you let the outer shell dry. Then you're going to open it and harvest the beans seeds inside for using as dried beans. Cucumbers, you're gonna also plant these after the soil warms and the air warms. You can plant them from seeds directly in the garden. They're usually ready in 60 to 65 days, depending on the variety, or some garden centers I see do sell plants. Now, cucumbers, squash, and melons produce separate male and female flowers. So the first flush are usually male, because I get lots of calls saying, I got flowers and I have no cucumbers or no squash. The second flush are male and female, you'll get pollination, fertilization, 
and then you'll start getting the fruit to harvest. So don't be alarmed. The male flowers are just have a straight stem with the bloom. The female flowers are like the one I showed you before with a mini cucumber down below. You can grow these vertically or sprawled on the ground as well. How we harvest them influences how we use them. If you're making sweet pickles, pick them when they're one and a half to two inches long. Dills, three to four inches long. Slicers, you want to have the skin nice and bright so it's nice and tender, six to nine inches. And then burpless cucumbers have been bred to be tasty, even bigger, you know, 10 to 12 inches. Um, if you let them get too ripe, the skin gets tough, the seeds form, they're not as tasty. So picking the cucumbers based on how you plan to use them. But growing vertically not only saves space, but you get better airflow, better light penetration, fewer disease problems. Um, in a pot, in a container with a tomato tower, or even in a hanging basket like you see here. Winter and summer squash and melons, they like to have the soil warm. Again, you can plant these from seeds depending. Winter squash is a lot longer season, usually 90 to 100 days. Check the seed packet. This is delicata, this is delicious. Um, but you wanna wait for the warm soil and air. Summer squash, ostia is my favorite. This is a variegated leaf plant. It's not powdery mildew very productive. I buy my seeds. I think Renee's garden is the only place, but find the zucchini you like. Summer squash. You can eat the squash blossoms. They're edible in summer and winter squash. And the zucchini and summer squash you harvest when the rinds are thin, the seeds are small or non-existent for the best flavor where winter squash, you're gonna leave on the plant longer. So harvest the bar type zucchini squash when they're six to eight inches long. Patty pan should be one and a half to three inches in diameter. Regular harvesting keeps them producing. Baseball bat zucchinis are not the goal. Those make a lot of zucchini bread and need a lot of sugar. Only do those when you wanna leave one on your neighbor's front porch on, leave a zucchini on your neighbor's front porch day on August 8th. Otherwise pick regularly, you'll have plenty. Winter squash, we're gonna let the rind get hard. And when that bottom spot touching the ground turns um, from green to kind of a cream or orange, it's ready to pick. Melons, wonderful. There's a lot of short season watermelons now. I remember growing up, I grew up in Ohio. My dad would I'd beg him to grow watermelons, but they were only long season. And even in Columbus, Ohio, our season was a little short back then. But now there are 60, 65 day watermelons for those of us with a short season. We harvest these again when that spot turns kind of a cream on the bottom, but the tendrils dry up. It means your watermelon's ready to pick. You can grow vertically, but when you're growing squash and melons with big fruit, you'll want to sling the fruit. And yes, macrame is back. So I used to say old nylon stockings to sling that fruit, tie it to the support. Thank goodness I don't have to wear those anymore. But an old t-shirt, strip of cotton cloth, or a macrame sling is a way to hold that fruit up so it doesn't rip off the plant before it's ready to harvest. Tomatoes, we've all been waiting for it. Tomatoes need warm air, warm soil. When you push the season, you know, if you plant a few weeks too early, those plants are going to be stunted. And even when the night temperatures are in the high 40s, the plant can suffer some damage to the leaves. You'll see some brown spots. So waiting till the air and soil are nice and warm is going to give you a jump start to the season. Otherwise, you can use cloches or floating row covers. Cloches are like mini greenhouses in the garden. Uh, row covers are fabric that let air, light, and water through, but trap the, the heat around the plants. I do that even when I plant late May, early June, the best time to plant in my neck of the woods. I'll often cover the plants because we get cold nights in June, and it speeds up my harvest by as much as a month. So, so tomatoes, there are two basic types. There's determinate and those grow a certain height and stop. And for those of you in the South, a lot of times that means they're done producing before the end of your season. For those of us with shorter seasons, they usually are ready to ripen 
mostly all at once um, towards the end of the growing season. So great for sauces and things. This is early resilience. This is an all America selection. My favorite Roma right now, great disease resistance. Um, I've had some disease problems in my garden. These are always resistant and great meaty tomatoes. Um, uh, kind of a nice, um, kind of like a medium sized tomato. Indeterminate tomatoes grow flower fruit, grow flower fruit till the frost kills the top. Or for those of you like me in a short season, you may pinch out the growing tip late in the season. That way it stops producing new flowers and the energy goes into forming fruit on any new flowers and maturing the fruit that are already started on the plant. This is yellow apple. It's a sweet yellow if you leave it on long enough, we'll turn orange and even red. It's an apple shaped small cherry tomato, very nice and sweet. The marketing material says it produces a thousand tomatoes per plant. I think it's more like 2000. I give my friends a bag and say, go out and harvest on your own. Um, if you're growing tomatoes in a pot, small scale determinant tomatoes, you only need a one or two gallon pot to contain them. Even some of the determinant ones benefit from support. Larger varieties, a three to five gallon pot. If you're looking to be economical, take a five gallon container of food grade, nothing that had toxic materials in it, drill holes in the bottom. A five gallon pot works great for a large tomato. When I, my my budget was limited when I first was uh, growing tomatoes as a young professional. That's what I use because that's what I could afford. Semi-determinate tomatoes like Terenzo or Lasagna are great in hanging baskets. Isn't this just as pretty as a flowering plant? So you might wanna grow those in a hanging basket. Great if you've got limited space or way to decorate or provide privacy on a deck or patio. So long, tall, leggy plants aren't the best, but for tomatoes, you can help them develop a more robust root system. So remove those lower leaves, dig a trench or dig a deep hole and bury the bottom of that tomato and gently um, bend the top where the leaves are still attached, cover that bare stem with soil and roots will develop all along the stem. And that way you're encouraging a deeper root system better for your plant. You can either stake or cage tomatoes. You could leave them sprawled on the ground. You'll have the most tomatoes develop, but you'll lose them to disease insects. And in my case, feet when I go out to harvest. If you stake your tomatoes, you're gonna need to do a lot of pruning. You're gonna need to uh, remove those suckers that form between the leaf and the stem because you're gonna train one, no more two than two main leaf stems up that stake because that's all that stake can hold. So when you get those little suckers forming between the leaf and the stem, remove those. You'll have fewer tomatoes, but earlier tomatoes. So maybe you want an early girl or 4th of July tomato because they ripen in about 60 days, stake it, and then you could have the first red tomatoes on the block. My dad always staked his tomatoes he would be out there every night. I, every year I try to do staking in his honor and I've just given it up because I'm not good at getting out every day to remove the suckers and continually tie them up. I cage my tomatoes. I like the Texas tomato towers. They're pricey, but they're sturdy and they store it flat, whatever works well for you. Um, but staking tomato or caging tomatoes, you'll, they'll be later but you'll have more and minimal pruning, just anything that gets in the way or as you need to prune to get to the fruit. But you need to do very minimal pruning on these. So you'll have a larger harvest. That's a tomato booster that you see um, developed. They found red reflected light, um, boosted productivity of peppers and tomatoes. Um, Roy Ryman um, introduced the first one and I met the guy that was manufacturing for him and I was a little skeptical. He gave me some to try and I really found some good results, but whatever works. And then you hear straw, you see straw is another good mulch to conserve the moisture. So depending on the variety, you'll be harvesting in 65 to 80 days. Fourth of July is an early maturing variety. You wanna wait till they're fully colored. That's gonna give you great flavor. If you can wait an additional five days, it'll be even better. 
But what's the problem? Ground squirrels and squirrels usually take a bite. You know, they go out, I swear, I'm like, I'll give them one more day and I go out and there's a bite in every tomato. They don't eat the whole thing, just every one they take a bite out. So you may end up har uh, harvesting them green and ripening them indoors. Just keep them in a, a dark place, spread them out. You don't need to wrap them up unless you're putting them close together. Um, I used to always, I grew up with a ping pong table covered with green tomatoes. At the end of the season, we'd bring them back up into a warm space when we needed to harvest them, give them a couple of days in the warmth. They ripen up and they're ready to eat. So it's a way to extend the season. Best flavor when they ripen outside, but uh, better than losing them to the critters or the frost. I'm not going to talk about all the problems, but tomatoes and peppers um, won't fruit readily if they're exposed to extreme heat or extreme cold. And so you need to wait for those temperatures to moderate a bit. So if you're seeing flowers and no fruit, check the weather. And then that nothing you can do to fix it, but that might be the problem. Blossom set will root work on tomatoes, but not peppers. Blossom end rot that you see here is a physiological disorder. The bottom of the fruit turns black. Just cut it off, throw it in the compost pile, eat the rest. It's not a disease problem. What happens is you'll read in books, it's a calcium deficiency, but make sure that it's really a calcium deficiency in your soil. Where I garden, we have plenty of calcium in our soil, and this is usually caused by a moisture imbalance. What dry, wet, dry soil, maybe you damage the roots as you weeded or when you staked them and towered them, or you know, you've had wet weather, dry weather, um, that can lead to a moisture imbalance. The plants can't pull up the calcium needed. So it is a calcium deficiency, but it's due to a lack of moisture. So mulching the soil, avoiding root damaging, watering thoroughly for a robust root system that has more space to get water to be evenly moist will help reduce the risk. The good news, it's just usually the first set of fruit that we've waited for all year, but at least it usually corrects itself and resolves the issue. But again, just cut off the black part, eat the rest. Peppers like tomatoes need warm soil, warm air, and they don't tolerate frost. And so those are gonna be planted again once the danger of frost is passed. They're great in containers and in the garden. Sweet peppers, lunchbox, just sweet. Just sweet and lunchbox are these nice, compact, sweet ones. Great for snacking, very productive. And look at that, a nice size plant in a pot. This was in my garden one year. I bought Touchdown, never grown it before. And I thought this gives you a great idea of the size. It was huge. So just think of the stuffed peppers or slice them and dipping. And I love to eat peppers in my, with my hummus. And so it had nice thick walls. So it holds up well for cooking or just eating fresh. And then this is um, Mama Mia. And I apologize to my Italian friends, Gallo or giallo um, peppers, a nice sweet one. Sorry for my mispronunciation. Um, a lot of people, they're great for roasting as well or eating fresh on a relish. Hot peppers, um, again, with hot peppers, depending on the variety, you may want to harvest them like jal jalapenos, we harvest red, but cayennes and giant ristras, we usually harvest when they start to color up. Um, and so they're pretty plants great if you like it hot. Um, and then check the temperature. For those of you that shop at Ebert's Greenhouse Village in Exonia, Wisconsin, uh, Mike, the vegetable grower there, loves hot pepper. So he lines up the pepper transplants from sweet to the very hottest. So always check the tags. I'm noticing a lot of the plant tags give you the Scoval heat unit. The higher the number, the hotter and the heat is influenced by the amount of moisture and the air temperature as well. So that's why you usually have a range because it can vary from place to place. I like potopino. If you have limited space, you can grow some um, jalapeno peppers in a pot. What I did is brought mine in in the fall, put them in a sunny window. So I extended my harvest by about a month. If you like the heat, but are you like the flavor of habaneros, but not the heat, try roulette. This is an all America selection. And you can see it looks just like a habanero, has that same flavor, but not the heat. My favorite, one of my favorite is shishito peppers 
one out of 10 are hot. And I never get the hot one and I like hot peppers. It's always the others that are eating it. But I like to harvest these, blister them in a little olive oil, put some sea salt on and Parmesan, and you've got a gourmet appetizer. In the restaurant, a plate of those costs 40 bucks. You can grow a lot of these yourselves. I've impressed my friends that cook well with my shishito pepper appetizers. So we're gonna harvest our sweet peppers. You can harvest them green, leave them on the plant longer to turn yellow, orange, or red. And some varieties are bred to color up faster and you'll get sweeter flavor. And as I mentioned, hot peppers, the jalapenos, we usually harvest when they're green. The others, we usually let them mature to orange or red. I'm going to quickly, and I know I've gone a little bit over my hour, but I just want to talk a little bit about growing herbs. One of the nice things, this was a, a self-watering window box type of planter with herbs. You see some sage on the left, thyme, lemon thyme in the middle, the purple basil in the back, some trailing uh, rosemary on the right, and parsley, flat leaf parsley in the back. Now I crammed a lot in there. Oh, and then there's also some um, upright rosemary between the basil and the sage. I crammed a lot in there, but I had to water and fertilize more because I really put the pressure on this limited amount of soil. So cilantro, um, if you make salsa, guacamole, if you like cilantro, it likes cooler temperatures. It tolerates frost. I find the frustrating part with cilantro is I like to make it with, use it in salsa. When are my tomatoes ready? When it's good and warm. When is the cilantro best? When it's nice and cool. So a couple things, plant early, harvest often, um, and then keep planting it throughout the season. So you always have young cilantro plants ready when the other vegetables that you like to combine it with are ready as well. Um, Delfino is, a, is an all America cilent, uh, all America cilantro that tends to be a little more heat tolerant and finer textured leaves as you see it. If your cilantro goes to flower, you can eat the flowers and the seeds are coriander. And so this is a dual uh, herb, cilantro when you eat the leaves, coriander when you eat the seeds. And then just let some reseed themselves. I have cilantro sprouting all over my garden because I just let it go to seed and replant. Parsley is a great biennial. So we grow it as an annual, right? The first year you get the leaves, you harvest, and it will make it through even my zone four or five uh, garden for the winter. Some people find the flavor a little more bitter that second year. Um, and so planting it fresh, it tolerates cool temperatures, it tolerates heat. And some people use this in place of cilantro. I like the curled parsley. Um, I like the texture. I use this in containers and gardens as an ornamental. I do use it for cooking, though most cooks like the flat-leafed parsley better. Swallowtail caterpillars love parsley, um, and so it's a great way to support those pollinators, and those caterpillars are going to turn into beautiful swallowtail butterflies. And usually there's enough that even if they devour all the leaves, you'll have plenty. A friend of mine, Arlene, the caterpillars had eaten all her parsley. She went to the grocery store, bought fresh parsley, put it in a vase in the garden for them. In my garden, it's time to pupate if you eat all the parsley. Uh, she's much nicer than me. And then have some fun planting your herbs in a colander or some other container. Dill reseeds readily. You plant it once, you'll have it. Another favorite of swallowtail caterpillars. I think this is my friend Patty Witt. She's a master gardener. And coneflowers reseed readily, and so do dill. I love this combination. I grow dill mostly for the swallowtail caterpillars, but great for pickling, great with fish dishes. You can eat the flowers, the seeds are edible, and so are the leaves. Um, and then just nice, fine texture. Um, oops, that was cilantro, sorry. Basil needs warm temperatures, so don't put it out too soon. If it's stressed by the cold, it's more susceptible to downy mildew. The good news is there's downy mildew resistant varieties out on the market. The red types tend to be more, the red and purple leaf ones tend to be more resistant. 
devotion, obsession from Rutgers University, our disease downy mildew resistant. What happens with downy mildew? The leaves turn yellow and the plant suddenly dies. So wait for the soil to warm. The other thing you can do is use the row covers for this. So when you plant, cover it with the floating row covers. It traps the heat protects them from frost. Um, so you'll get good productivity. It also keeps the Japanese beetles off. So if you have Japanese beetles, they love basil. And so by covering the plants, they can't get to it and damage it. No, it's not as pretty as your basil as an ornamental, but you'll have a nice harvest and you can extend the season that way. Great Dulce Fresco is an All-America selection, nice and compact great for containers. Siam queen, isn't this beautiful? We usually harvest before it sets bloom for the greatest oil concentration, but the flowers are edible as well in basil and the pollinators like them. Um, I am usually one of those people that kind of the basil starts setting flowers before I get out to keep on the harvest. And I use the flowers just like I use the leaves. Regular harvesting, you'll have more production and better, more intense flavor. Chives, a perennial herb, very cold tolerant. I think it's hardy to zone four, maybe even three. Check the handout. The flowers are edible as well as the leaves. It reseeds everywhere. This is my patio. And any crack or crevice, I find chives growing. And I grow my chives in a pot on my patio. So removing the flowers before they set seed is a great way to reduce this issue. I like to use them in with my flower beds, but I quit doing that because I had chives everywhere to weed out. Geisha garlic chives. Garlic chives, notice the leaves are flatter. It has more of a garlic flavor. They don't produce the garlic bulb. This is from All America Selection, just to remind me to say it's got that garlic flavor. But great, tasty. It does recede readily, but a nice flavor as well. Mint, very aggressive. I grow it in a container on cement or a wood deck away from any soil. It does grow, but it's wonderful. It is a perennial, so if you can keep it contained in a garden bed, that works great. Some people will sink a container, leave about an inch or two of the lip above ground. It won't totally contain it, but it slows the spread down. Mint is great for desserts, for beverages. Um, it's a wonderful, I love chocolate mint. As you can see on the left, it's excellent for your desserts. So it is a great plant, good for digestion, lots of uses in teas. Oregano is just as aggressive as mint. Um, I, we ha I had a partner for a while that was providing vegetable plants, flats of them for our state fair garden. I thought, oh, oregano will be a nice edible ground cover. Um, we are still weeding it out after 15 years. Um, yes, it's a great ground cover, but it's very aggressive. So again, like mint, put it where it can be contained. It does recede if you don't you know, harvest in a timely manner, um, but it's, I find it's easier to keep after than the chives. Sage, good for full sun, well-drained soils, hardy to zone five, possibly four. I like tricolor sage to grow in containers with flowers. Golden sage is beautiful. Um, it does produce blooms. You wanna harvest before that, but the flowers are blue and great for the pollinators. And this is just bicolor. Time, another one that likes full sun, needs well-drained soils. It's perennial to zone. I've seen it growing quite successfully in parts of Minnesota. So zone four for sure, possibly three, depending on the variety. Makes a great fragrant ground cover. Um, I find I wait till it starts to leaf out, then I prune off whatever's dead, especially if you have heavy, poorly drained soil, you may get some dieback. I know I went through this quickly, and if you're new to gardening, you're probably going, oh, that's a lot to know and do. Most importantly, have some fun. Every year, I have some type of failure. Either a disease takes out a plant, an insect moves in, I didn't, you know, I did something wrong. I'm kind of late on getting my seed started. But you know what? I always end up with plenty of vegetables and there's always the farmer's market. I learn more from my failures than my successes because I go, mm, that's what I did wrong. So I won't do it again. So relax and have fun. 
Um, please check out our other activities. As I mentioned, the public libraries of Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan have joined us in this, this project. Two more webinars, one in May 3rd, the other in the fall, and then fun activities. I'll have some videos this summer, activities that you can do um, with friends and family to help you with your garden, but also just to have fun and enjoy the growing season no matter where you garden. Please stay connected. All my information is on the bottom of the handout and help me grow gardeners. Someone inspired you, inspire someone else. This was one of my experiments that went bad. We had Barbie doll sized potatoes in our potato box. I learned that water and fertilizer were very important for growing better sized potatoes in that box. My granddaughter, this was years ago, didn't seem to mind those little tiny potatoes. But help me grow gardeners. You know how good it makes you feel. You know all the benefits. Help share that with others, whether they're youngsters, young families, or new retirees. Thanks again to Milwaukee Public Library for hosting this event. They take the pressure off of me for the technical support. Plus, they're favorite partners of mine throughout my whole career. So I always feel like it's fun to work with them. And also thanks for We Energies for sponsoring not only this webinar, but the whole library program. The libraries are doing a lot of additional activities, so check with your local library. And We Energies is sponsoring all of the projects that you see there. And now back to um, Kelly and Beth. And I appreciate you guys letting me go over. Um, I tried eliminating some images, but I decided to talk faster instead, so sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much, Melinda. I, I'm definitely going to go back and look at all the slides because there's a lot of information in this presentation. Sorry. No, no, don't apologize. Um, okay, so I know we just have about 15 minutes left here to get to questions. So I will start right away with a, qu a question from Sue Meyer. Um, okay, Sue says, let's see. Uh, let's see, uh, I think she's starting with a statement. Put down a clear plastic used shower curtain on an area where I went to kill weeds last fall and wonder how long it will take to kill the many weeds that we don't want coming back. These weeds include, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. What are the weeds? Yes. These weeds include wild raspberries, some mm. wild garlic mustard, which of course has seeds that will keep coming up and quack and crab grasses. Thank you. Ooh. So great, great, Sue. One, I didn't talk a lot about solarizing and there's been some research in different parts of the country. Kansas State found six to eight weeks in the hottest part of the growing season. That's like most of our growing season in the North. Um, that clear plastic will kill the seeds and a lot of the roots of your perennials and even some disease organisms. University of Minnesota was talking about two weeks, but boy, I kind of am concerned about that. Um, raspberries, uh, brambles that you mentioned, they have a pretty extensive root system. So I always recommend edging the garden bed so they can't get any nutrients from any plants they might be connected to outside like quack grass that spreads by rhizome. Um, quack, you're probably okay with if you give it, you know, if you can wait until we get, you get a good month of hot temperatures, depending on where you live and depending on how our spring and summer go. We had 80 degrees here in Wisconsin and parts of the Midwest right for a week and then I had 29 degrees for about five hours the other morning and so it's been a crazy spring all over the country so if you can give it at least six weeks of good hot weather air temperature outside that's going to increase your success my friend Ray Greiton who taught me a lot about gardening um, and growing multiple crops and making compost what he would do is he would prep his soil. He didn't have the weed problems you did, Sue. He'd cover it only for a couple of weeks. And then he'd have the soil prepped. He'd cover it with the clear plastic, lift it, lightly cultivate to take care of any weed, any seedlings that had sprouted. And it wouldn't, and then he would plant his garden. He'd still have some weeds, but not as many. But because you're trying to kill those perennials, if you can give it six weeks of good hot weather, you're going to have much better success. Thanks, Blonda. Let's see. Next question we've got. Let's see from Jeanette. Jeanette says, if you keep the carrots, et cetera, in the garden during the winter, are you digging out and then leaving them in loose soil or do you dig them out in the middle of winter? How do you dig in the frozen soil? That's a great question. So a couple things that 
there are a couple different recommendations. What I've done and has worked for me is I wait till the soil gets crunchy. So it's not frozen. You could still get a trowel in, but it's just starting to get a little crunchy. So it ins you know, kind of keeps that in. And then I throw some straw or marsh hay over to kind of keep it at that temperature. I usually wait until a winter thaw and we always seem to have one. And that's when I harvest mine and dig them out. Some people recommend that you, when the soil's cool, but not starting to get crunchy, that you cover it at that point with a mulch to keep it from freezing, keep it cold. So you want the soil to be nice and cold, but before it starts to freeze and then dig as you need to. But if you do get that winter thaw, what I found has happened is if you don't harvest, sometimes they turn to mush, depending on how long that winter thaw is. You know, this winter for us, we had some cold and we had a lot of warm and cold and warm and cold and that can frost even actually push plants out of the ground. And I find that leaving it just a little crunchy for me worked well. So you might need to experiment with the row cover the, the soil never really froze under there, um, but the snow covered it. And so that kept it nice and cold. And then actually I had some shallots over winter under there, my carrots over wintered under there. And so it worked quite well. Some, you just kind of have to practice to see what works well for you. So great question. Let's see, Mary is asking, do you have a good way to get rid of thistles? Oh, you know, Thistles are great for the goldfinches. I'm trying to remember that as I'm trying to dig them out. So a couple things you can do. And if you don't want to use a chemical, obviously continually cutting them at ground level, you'll eventually starve them to death. Even the perennial ones, just remember, make sure you get all parts of it and cut them as soon as they sprout. Wear good thick gloves to keep the then, you know, those little prickers out of your hands. Um, some people will cut and pour salt just in the stem. You don't want to salt the soil, but that'll help desiccate in that stem. Some will pour vinegar. Some of the organics uh, don't tend to translocate, move from the leaves and stem into the root. So you may need to do several applications if you do an organic. If you do a total vegetation killer, like a finale or Roundup, read and follow label directions carefully, especially if you're dealing with thistles in a food garden, anywhere really, you always wanna read and follow label directions. Some people will paint them on the leaves to minimize the use of that chemical. It's absorbed through the leaves, down the stem and into the roots. So timing, check the label for that. But if you don't wanna use chemicals and digging is an option, or just at least cutting them to ground level, but you got to keep after it and be more persistent than the thistle. And definitely um, before they set seed, the birds love the seeds, but that means you'll have a thousand thistles next year to weed. So I don't have an easy solution, unfortunately. Okay, so Sharon wants to know, is it safe for plants to put worms in the planters themselves without harming the plants? So um, I, I've kind of been monitoring red worm research and haven't seen that the red worms are harmful. Uh, they do digest all that organic material. If you have good quality soil, I wouldn't worry about putting worms into that potting mix because you're, if you're doing a container, you've got soil that has organic matter, maybe perlite or vermiculite or rice hulls for drainage. So you don't really need those worms in there to aerate the soil. Um, hopefully you don't have jumping worms because they eat the organic matter at a level that's crazy. And even earthworms will digest organic matter. They're better earthworms in the garden. They don't move as quickly or as far. They're not good in our, wo our woods. Red worms, I have not seen. Um, I've been following. Some people will microwave their worm castings just to make sure they're not spreading. But I've, I've, I've been monitoring, but we keep learning new things all the time. So I use my worm castings in containers. So if there, if there was a red worm, it wouldn't hurt. Um, but I don't purposely put them in. So I don't know if that really answers your question. If they accidentally end up in there, not a problem, but I wouldn't add them to the soil on purpose. 
All right, Deborah would like to know, I kept Brussels sprouts in the garden over winter and now Ooh. the sprouts, now the sprouts near the ground are green and growing. What can I do with the new growth? And what do I do with the rest of the plant, which looks dead? Cut off the dead parts? Yeah, I would say um, cut off the dead parts. You want to just, you know, maybe even give it a little time to make sure nothing sprouts off of them. I have not, I, I have kale over winter in my garden, often from the ground level. It usually will do that in a zone five, maybe even a zone four. I've not had, I usually pull my Brussels sprouts in the fall. So I would say, just give it a little more time. See, make sure if it's dead on top, cut that portion off and see what happens. You've got nothing to lose. And then let us know if you were able to harvest Brussels sprouts, because I've never tried that. Um, I'm guessing it might be a biennial like parsley. And so it may flower instead of putting energy into forming the sprouts. But if you have room to see what happens, do that and let us know. Um, but I'm guessing you may get flowers rather than more sprouts along the stem, but maybe you'll get both. So um, let us know. Meryl would like to know, um, do you ever use or recommend using landscape fabric in the garden to prevent weeds? Landscape fabric is great. Um, it does do a great job preventing weeds. I'm a big organic mulch person just because I always feel like I need to fix help my soil any way I can. If you do use landscape fabric, I would recommend pulling it off in the fall, maybe top dressing with some shredded leaves or something so that you're adding organic matter in. A master gardener, when I ran the program in Milwaukee County years ago, told me he used he used landscape fabric, never had to do any weeding. And in the fall, he'd take it up and take it to the laundromat and put it in the laundromat to wash it. At the time, I was using laundromats, and I'm like, where are you washing your weed barrier? Because I don't want to put my clothes in there. But he would just then reuse it every year, which is kind of cool because he washed it. So any disease organisms, right? Then in the fall, you could top dress with some organic compost. So you're amending the soil, even if you just top dress it before you put the weed berry down or in the fall. Um, nice part of putting mulch down is covering it for the winter. And then those leaves will break down over winter. And then you could put the weed barrier back in. So it, it is it does a great job of keeping the weeds down. Just make sure you're taking care of your soil. Thanks for asking that. That's a good point. Question from Mary, how do you keep bird's nests out of hanging tomato baskets? You know, good question. I, I feed the birds. I have birds all over my property. And a couple of things. When I plant my seeds, I use row cover. Um, one, it, it speeds germination, but it protects those seeds from the birds picking them out of the soil. I also will use it when I initially plant flowers or vegetables in hanging baskets or a netting material. Usually if you do that right at the beginning of the season, um, that they usually find another place to net to nest. So just do it initially, then you can remove that netting later. Um, I had some fake flowers in a basket on my front door and I had a bird, my cat kept going to the door and here's a bird nesting in my basket of fake flowers that I had a bird's nest in there, lesson learned. So um, yeah, just put some netting over it or do some row cover um, initially, and that will keep the birds, I find it keeps the birds away while they're in their nesting mode. And that usually is enough. Um, and then by the time, if it's a bird that does a second nesting midsummer, usually your tomatoes hopefully will be big enough to keep them, um, that they'll find some place else to nest. Good question. Question from Megan. For irrigation systems, do you recommend using soaker irrigation tubing or polyth polyethylene tubing with evenly spaced emitters? You know, I think whatever works best. Sometimes with um, soils, uh, hard soils with a lot of chemicals, hard minerals in it, they'll clog up. Um, I think I soaker hoses are an advantage because you lay them out and um, I find sometimes with the emitters, the PVC pipe and the emitters, um, just always check if you've got ground squirrels or any critters, sometimes those get, you know, pulled out or moved away from the plant. 
Um, I, for me, um, soaker hoses work pretty well, um, but both systems work. I think depends on how you like to garden and the space available. Um, lots of good DIY systems out there. When I talked watering, I didn't mention, you know, soaker hoses and drip irrigation. Um, the emitter tubes are great ways to reduce watering, time spent watering, and also conserve moisture because you're putting the water right where it belongs. Hand watering um, is also, it conserves water better than overhead sprinkling, but you really have to make sure you get a good soaking. And a lot of us aren't patient enough to do it, myself included. So using soaker hoses, either one will work. So I think whichever system you find works best for you. Question from Jackie, can asparagus be planted in pots? Yes, now depending on where you live, you will need to, um, if you're in a cold climate, you'll need to protect it over winter. I just pulled all my stuff out of the garage. I overwinter some things in my unheated garage. Or um, if you put it in an old nursery pot, bury that pot in a vacant part of the garden. Or I'm guessing if you're doing it in a container, you probably don't have room to do it. So if you can find someone with an unheated garage, if you're in a cold climate or place it somewhere and surround it, you know, if on your balcony maybe, you might have a storage bin, put some um, packing peanuts or something to insulate it, uh, the roots. That's what the key thing is. It's hardy, but those roots will be above ground now and exposed to a colder temperature than if they were in the ground. So you'll want a good You'll want a good size pot, like something that a tree nursery pot that a tree was grown in, something deep, you know, at least a good 12 inches deep and at least 12 or 15 inches wide. Um, but you'll have a smaller harvest, but it's definitely a lot of fun. And when it outgrows that, you could divide it into two pots or give it to someone to put in their garden and start over again. So I just want to say to everyone, I know we're at time. This will be sent out. The recording will be sent out in an email. Um, we'll have it on our YouTube channel along with the handout. Um, let's do one more question here from okay. Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth says, I just read that forever, forever chemicals are in fertilizer made from sewage. Given malorganite is from sewage and industrial waste, is it a good idea to use it when planting your garden? That's a great question. So those forever chemicals, PFAs, PF, PSFs, PFSs and PFAs, there's been some research and it's not just biosolids. It's in a lot of products. It's in cosmetics, it's in food, it's in a lot of different products. One thing is when you garden, you get to choose what you put on your garden. Malorganite is tested daily and weekly. Um, its levels of these forever chemicals are lower than Maine, which has the most stringent levels and also below the EPA standards. Um, if you're not comfortable, don't use it on your product. So, and check commercial fertilizers as well. Um, so it's not just the biosolids. Um, so a lot of our fertilizers, uh, biosolids are held to a higher standard, tested more regularly. So I choose to use it on my food crops. Um, you may not, and that's okay. That's why we garden, right? We get to choose, but always read the label and check natural fertilizers aren't organic. If you're looking for organic, it should see OMRI, Organic Materials Research Institute approved, um, so that you get what you want when you buy a product. So that's a great question. Those forever chemicals are something that the, a lot of the sewage dip, uh, like Milwaukee Metro sewage and other um, water treatment plants are trying to work with legislators to minimize those chemicals in products because they end up there because they're going through our system. So we're getting them more directly in some of those other products. So they're trying to help find ways to limit them in the environment and in us so that it's less of a problem on that end. So excellent question. And I try to cover a lot of different ways to garden so you can pick what works best for you with your time, your space and your gardening goals. You know, you may want to go totally organic and use just, you know, worm castings and those kind of things. Fish emulsion, there's concern about mercury and fish emulsion products. So, you know, we keep finding out more and more things. So doing your research is definitely a good way to make sure you get what you want. 
All right, so thanks so much to Melinda for this wonderful presentation tonight. Um, so again, we'll be sending out the recording uh, probably in a couple of days, um, and you'll have a link to that on the Milwaukee Public Library YouTube channel along with the handout. Um, Melinda, if, if someone has a question and it wasn't answered tonight, can they send that to you in an email? You bet, at info at melindamyers.com. I'll be glad to answer it. And the other thing is I put links to other vegetable gardening webinar recordings that are on my website. So there's some other information available too, because I know I covered a lot in a little time, but check that out and info at melindamyers.com. Just be patient. I'll try to get to them as quickly as I can. Thank you. And I want to also plug um, the next webinar that we'll have with Melinda is on May 3rd at 6.30 p.m. And it is about gardening in a challenging climate. So what can we do to garden as well as we can given climate change and, and changing weather that we're all experiencing? And thank you all for joining us so much. I appreciate you giving me some time to talk gardening. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Melinda. And thanks to everyone that uh, attended tonight. Uh, check mpl.org for more great events coming up. And we'll see you on May 3rd for the next webinar with Melinda. Have a great evening, everybody. Take care. Bye now.